Well, I want to welcome you back into this space uh, to another time of sharing our stories and memories of Elaine um, and continue to do that in a way that gives recognition and gratitude to God for the ways that she impacted our lives and the way that she reflected God's love in this world. It's very okay to retell a story here that you already may be told in the fellowship hall. Uh, that's not a problem. Um, and um, we just ask that you please come up to the mic up here to share. Uh, use handrails where we can help you if need be. Um, and, uh, or yes, if you need to, we can uh, stand there, at the, there on the floor if that's a little easier to share. Um, so I invite you to come up and, and make your way up uh, if you, and, and, and don't wait for someone else to finish sharing before you come up. You can come sit on the pews a little bit closer. But as we share, uh, part of this is, you know, our, our recognizing our, our laughter, our tears, our reflections, our reflections of our expression of gratitude to God for Elaine's life. So I ask that after we share, we simply respond to someone's story with, Thanks be to God um, after, after we hear someone's story, no matter how funny or tearful it is. So I guess I'll get us started since no one's jumping up to come. That's all right. Uh, I love the um, timeline of Elaine's life that Dan laid out. Um, I uh, have known Elaine um, being a pastor here at College Mennonite for the last 13 years. Um, and I mostly know Elaine through Dan. Um, and Dan, in working with the youth, has a very unique role here in the congregation of uh, supporting them and being a representative, an advocate for College Mennonite at youth events, at their extracurriculars. Uh, whether that's even happening here in Goshen or in the county or even in Indianapolis, going wherever to support them on behalf of the congregation. Several years ago, to my surprise, see, I saw, saw Dan at an event with his CMC button on, um, but there was Elaine with him. Um, and she had come along and she was really enjoying herself and having a great time. Uh, and so I went up and talked to her afterwards. And, um, you know, she, she, expressed that she appreciated being there, being a part of this, supporting the youth. That was always something she wanted to do, but she also knew that this was something that Dan felt very called to, and she wanted to give him the space to do that, to always support him in that, and not going along all the time, but uh, occasionally going along, but also supporting him as he went. And as she was talking, I was reminded of, of a, a quote that I heard after I had met someone that I wanted to marry uh, was to let there be spaces in your togetherness. Um, and, and that seemed to be what Elaine was getting across of that uniqueness of their, their relationship together, of being one, as we hear in scripture, but also when you are giving your gifts to not let your right hand know what your left is doing. Um, and this unique combination of that uh, within their relationship uh, and the way they shared God's love in this world. So, thanks be to God. Who else would like to share? Thank you. I'm up here because I, when I look out, I maybe knew Elaine before many of you did. I grew up on a farm just down the road from her. My dad and her dad were brothers, and they shared a lot of farm machinery together. But growing up on the farm, as Elaine and I did, you make your own fun on a farm. One of the fun things we had was swings. Now, some people had tire swings, we had a sack swing. Elaine had the basic board swing, but hers wasn't just basic because she would take her dog on the swing with her. 
And now you heard today how Elaine loves music. You all know that. But did you know that she taught her dog to sing too? <laughs> she would get on the swing. The higher she went, the higher she would pitch her music. And the dog would respond as she went back. And she would sing again. And the dog would respond. I think, if I remember right, the dog's name is Penny. Is that, oh, I am right, so you know the story. And uh, it's true, it's all true, right? <laughs> but um, it's a fond thing. It's what I think of when I think of Elaine. Thank you for, thanks be to God. I'm Rubina Summers, and I first uh, met Dan and Elaine probably when we first started coming to this church around 1998, before we had kids. And <clears throat> I've always uh, marveled at them because, well, you all know that Dan comes to everything, so he went to everything that my kids were in. And by the way, Priya really wanted to be here today. She's actually at home. Kendall's with her. She has an infection. Half, she looks kind of droopy. It's very weird. But anyway. Um, so, one, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that, can we, just, can we just say how beautiful Elaine was? I mean, just, I know we shouldn't focus on physical beauty, but I'm just going to take a minute and say, wow, she was beautiful. And she is beautiful because she remains with us. And I want to thank you, Dan, for sharing those beautiful memories because we did not get to know her in, that, in all of those different facets of her life. But really, this is directed to you, Barb. I know how hard it is when you lose your mother. And um, actually, this is my grandmother, Sari, hanging behind us right now. And um, your mother, as you know, was an amazing woman. And the greatest thing about having the presence of your mother is it, it's with you forever. And so you embody things. You'll start sounding like her. It's kind of scary. Um, but one of my fondest memories of the three of you is when I remember when things right around that time, 2005, 6, 7, especially I remember seeing the three of you and your mom and dad's arms around you, like behind you. And um, so her arms remain around you for the rest of your life. Thanks, B. I have to make myself do this now or I won't do it. My name is John Zare. I have been in the Westview school system since 1978. Um, I first knew Elaine, I'd say, about 1980. I knew Barb at that time, too. I'm not sure if she remembers me, but I certainly remember her. <laughs> um, anyway, um, Elaine and I first met in a Phil Clemens choir at the college church. Um, she had a beautiful voice. And years later, she and I, in front of our entire student body, sang a duet between a dog and a cat. Now, I, I don't know if you ever heard that, Dan. It, it was one of the highlights of my musical career, I would say. And it was opera. It's the only opera I think I've ever sung in my entire life. Um, uh, I'm not a big fan of opera. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I have one other story I want to relate, which... <laughs> shows you Elaine's sense of humor. Um, you, she was truly unpredictable. One, one day at school, and we had a lot of really good cooks, we had something that 
some kind of sandwich that was new. And the cooks, of course, and I think we weren't even st serving ourselves yet. It was still when they gave us the food. Uh, anyway, we were sitting, I think we were in the teacher's lounge, but I'm not 100% sure. Elaine didn't buy school lunch that day. She had her own lunch. And one of the first year teachers was sitting nearby. It was actually somebody I know quite well. He was one of my students in fifth, when he was a fifth grader. Anyway, we were talking about the food and Elaine looked at his plate and said, she said, wow, that looks good. She grabbed it, jump, <laughs> set it back. And he was so taken aback that eventually he left the room. He couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't f finish his lunch. He was so emotionally overwrought over what she had done. It was one of the funniest th And he was the, the kind of guy that was kind of a practical joker himself. So in a certain sense, yeah, it served him right. But uh, yeah, I had never seen anything quite like that. And I don't think I ever have. I'm Diane Krupp <clears throat> from Harleysville, Pennsylvania. I was in Alderfer when I met Elaine Gehrig. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, just a few opening thoughts. I feel like I still have not really comprehended that Elaine is gone from this earth. Um, <clears throat> the last time I saw her was at our 50th college class reunion here at Goshen. And I was at with Dan and Elaine for tea afterward, as we usually did. And, you know, we all know where it went from then. COVID was the first big thing. And then Elaine needing to be uh, put into a place away from home. I had hoped I could come to Russ's memorial and see her at the same time, but that was COVID's interference still. So um, I finally, the other night, or maybe it was yesterday, driving out here, <clears throat> I came up with an image or a metaphor for my feelings at this point as I can't find words in uh, accepting this, which it obviously is real. Is I don't know if any of you are old enough to have ringing in your ears, but you know, at nighttime, the ringing sort of turns to a buzz, and no matter what you do, you can't shake it off, you can't shut it up, you can't get rid of it, and that's sort of how I see this news with Elaine not being here. I'll adjust, and you all have the biggest adjustment, but um, anyway, where do you begin to talk about somebody of the depth, breadth, height of Elaine as a friend, and as what she gave me in friendship. We met, and I'm going to stick with notes so I don't get off the subject or too emotional. We met as nursing students at Goshen our sophomore year. That would have been after Elaine came from Heston. Uh, we started bonding probably in our nursing labs, you know, where you give each other enemas and stuff like that. Well, the most significant was the time we had to put um, endo, um, nasogastric tubes into each other. You know, we were trying to get it in the nose and down into the mouth, stomach, not into the lungs. And um, the couple beside us, two students, all of a sudden, one was coughing and choking and the other one was sort of gasping. Here the tube went in the mouth, in her nose, but came out the mouth. It didn't quite go where it was supposed to go. So anyway, <clears throat> situations like that sort of help you bond. And then that same year, I'm not sure how we decided, but Elaine and I decided to take the life-saving course at Goshen High School. It was one of the electives. And January and February, horribly cold when we put on our swimming suits, heavy coats. Then when we come home, we had wet hair, heavy coats. 
But the best part of that was, well, first of all, I don't know if this was the best part, but we ended up being the only women in the class. So the, the most memorable night was the night we had to do the cross chest carry for a struggling victim, and they were supposed to fight us off, and we had to just hold on as tight as we could and not, them, <clears throat> not let them go down or have us go down. So we kind of had some fun with that, trying to figure out who had the most muscular, broad-chested hunk. And then we also, of course, had to tell that to our dorm friends. So that was fun. Okay, then further bonding. Well, I, t I did that one. The, um, just a second here, I told you I'd have to keep on track or I'd go off. Oh, our summer at Westville then, we were doing psych nursing. And that was basically uneventful, except for when we come back to the dorms. We both like to sunbathe. Not, not healthy, I know. But we had fun comparing tans, because we both tanned easily. And we also discovered then that we both really liked black licorice. So that's been a common communal food that we have. Our junior year then, we became roommates. And in those days, the junior year was known as the most intense for students because we had to go to Elkhart Hospital, and that meant being at the bus, the, going to the bus, which we called the Gray Dog. It was kind of an old rattle trap bus. In the parking lot, we had to be there by 6 o'clock in the morning. Well, neither Elaine nor I were, I am still not, real fond of early risings. So what we did, and this was Elaine's idea, I'm sure, she set the alarm for 3.30 so we could wake up and be so thrilled we had two more hours to sleep before we had to get up. And um, it wasn't so bad. Okay, then came the unexpected detour that Dan referred to in terms of how they met and, you know, the blind date thing and everything else. And any of us who knew Elaine at that time knew that she was swept off her feet with stars in her eyes quite quickly. And she wasn't necessarily that kind of uh, easy win. So anyway, <laughs> they ended up planning the wedding to happen that December. That would have been 1966 of our junior year, and one piece of that uh, that wasn't so happy was, for me, she had asked me to be a bridesmaid, which of course I was thrilled and said, yes, I'll be there, totally honored. And then I had um, my weekly phone call home, and uh, my mother was not nearly so thrilled. In fact, she was so emotional, I was sort of taken off guard. And her basic thing was, how can you do this to us two Christmases in a row? Because the Christmas before, I was a bridesmaid for Mary Helen Lichty, who married Terry Nossiger in Archibald, Ohio. And that was Christmas Eve, and theirs was 23rd of December. So that meant, we'd have another disrupted Christmas. Well, I hadn't had any therapy yet by that, at that point. So I felt like I had no choice but to go home and not be in their wedding. I was devastated. I dreaded telling Elaine. It felt like I was rejecting her. It was terrible, but dear Elaine came through as her wonderfully gracious self. She did not judge me and she did not judge my mother, and I think our relationship only got better as the years went on. One thing about her being engaged, um, as Dan mentioned, Elaine was known for having some issues with decision-making, especially big ones, and I sort of shared that with her, common, that we sort of had that common ground. The only thing she ever mentioned about having any questions about the decision to marry Dan when they married, where she says that she stood by the mailbox, ready to drop those invitations. She thought, oh, this is really final if I put them in the mail. She did, <laughs> and was happy for it. Then the next th 
stories I started hearing was how she'd wake up in the middle of the night and think Dan wasn't breathing. So she'd just wait there and wait there till she saw him breathe, and she could go back to sleep. So, <laughs> you know, she had no regrets. So, um, after that, we graduated and went our separate ways, and um, that's where I kind of come to these um, kind of show and tell pieces. There's so much that happened in those years, as you all know, happens. The older we get, the longer we live. Some are good, some are not so good. I'll just show you a few tangibles of Elaine's influence on my life in that time. She gave me this little grandma book. It was one of the times she and Joanne Miller and I went away for a weekend. This was Pittsburgh, and she handed me this because our um, first grandchild had been born. And that was right at the very same time that she was threatened with losing her grandchildren. And, um, you know, all that was happening that was referenced with regard to courtrooms and lawyers, et cetera. So, you know, you, I felt sort of funny even talking about grandchildren. And here she gave me this grandma book, Diane with Love, Elaine. Then, a couple other things that were totally Elaine over the years. She'd send me cartoons and jokes. And um, I have one of them I want to close with. But um, you just never knew what was going to pop up in those letters. And then at a particularly bumpy time for Elaine and Dan and Barb, and also myself at that time, she sent me a copy of the hymn, Oh God and Restless Living. She said they had sung it in church that morning, and she thought it fit some of the discussions we had been having about life and its ups and downs. I'll read you the first verse. It's, O oh God, in restless living, we lose our spirit's peace. Calm our, calm our unwise confusion. Bid those our clamor cease. Let anxious hearts grow quiet like pools of evening still till they reflect the heavenness of all your, that all your spirit can fill. So from cartoons to hymns. And then um, during the time that, you know, Elaine was having issues with vision and had not yet received a diagnosis, we spent a lot of time talking about our brains partially because we knew that we had a lot in common, sometimes with doing goofy things that we didn't really plan to do or feel uncoordinated or out of balance. And then it became more intense as she started having more symptoms. And I happened to have a history of three different regimens of chemotherapy over a 12-year period. And, you know, I'm claiming chemo brain, which I know, Jean probably thinks it's a good excuse sometimes, but <laughs> it's been proven. So anyway, we talked about brains, and then one of the times we were together, she brought this book on how God changes your brain, which is actually a book on the spiritual life and our spiritual connectedness to all people, the mind-body um, issue for health for all of us, and that's that. And then, um, well, I guess that's the last tangible thing. But I do want to read this cartoon because um, it actually started with Dan. She doesn't have a date on this, but she wrote, Dan, Dan saw this in the paper this morning and cut it out for me. He couldn't believe how perfect it was. And then I thought of you. So I made a copy because I thought you just might relate to it too. Okay, so it's a real life adventures cartoon. I don't know, is that Goshen News or Alcart Truth? I don't know. But anyway, it shows a man with a necktie standing here. Well, I guess he's coming home from work because he says, boy, you were really having trouble deciding what to wear this morning. What did you end up wearing to work? And then here's the woman down there kind of huddled by the side of the couch saying, <clears throat> well, I never got to work. I just kept trying on outfits 
and before I knew it, it was five o'clock. So I've been here eating ice cream ever since. <laughs> so Elaine, wherever you are, I want to tell you that I couldn't decide what to bring to wear to your service. I was extra tired when I was packing, so it was extra bad. But I want you to know that I had the possibility of seven different outfits I could have worn to your wedding. That doesn't mean seven different pieces. It was mix and match, burgundy and black, or gray, or something. But I'm doing that in honor of you, who I see has lived life in so many ways that I hope to be remembered by. And I came upon a quote recently um, that made me think of Elaine and her spiritual life and her courage and her faith and resilience. The quotation was, do not put a period where God has placed a comma. And then um, the next line was, God is not finished with us yet. I will ever miss her and thank you so much for remaining friends to me too. Larry Unschwarzenegger is my name. Elaine was a dear friend of ours for more than 30 years. We had an Iowa connection, which always made it fun. I was a freshman at IMS when she was a senior. I thought she was so beautiful, as someone mentioned earlier, but she didn't remember me. And we laughed, we laughed that maybe it was because I was 4'11", weighed 78 pounds when I, started, when I was a freshman. <clears throat> As you know well, she had a great sense of humor and loved to tease. She and Dan played tennis with Nance and me every week for many years. Elaine and I were always teammates because they said early on, this is the way you do it so that you don't yell at your partner. We had man uh, and, and we had a lot of fun. We would. She and I, we would warm up, um, and then when we got warmed up, we would pull our sweats, and we would have wild shorts on, either pink ones or orange ones or something, to kind of try and shock them a little bit. But <clears throat> we had many great battles with them, but as some of you know who play tennis, Dan had this nasty chop that almost drilled the spinning ball into the asphalt. And then it got, and then when it, uh, when then it got tough was when the wild bounce and trying to respond to it. Uh, it was tough for both of us, but it was tough to deal with for Elaine sometimes, and sometimes it kind of got the best of her. And one time they announced they had an anniversary coming up. It was their 25th. And it was Elaine's idea. She asked if she could be his partner for a few weeks so she could like him a little better. <laughs> and it obviously worked because we also helped them celebrate their 50th anniversary. I have been going through past emails for 20 years of worth, and it's almost like reading a diary. And I've enjoyed the memories and the humor and I have one quick example. <clears throat> she would often send these funny little things, and this one here was a dress code for seniors. It was fashion tips. And it said, many of us over 65 are a bit confused about how we should present ourselves. We're unsure about the kind of image we're projecting, whether or not we are correct to conform with current fashions. In general, and despite what you may have seen on the streets, the following combinations do not go together and should be avoided. A nose ring and bifocals, spiked hair and bald spots, a pierced tongue and dentures, min mini skirts and support hose, ankle, bl ankle bracelets and corn pads, speedos and cellulite, 
That's Elaine. A belly button ring and abdo ab abdomen surgery scars. Unbuttoned disco shirts and a heart monitor. Midriff shirts and a midriff bulge. Bikinis and liver spots. Short shorts and varicose veins. Inline skates and a walker. Said, please keep these guidelines foremost in your mind. Knowing Elaine, you can imagine that I also left out a few. <laughs> Elaine was kind, knowledgeable, and fun, and we will miss her. Hello, I hadn't planned to speak, but my name's June Yoder, and I got to know Elaine. Actually, I remember admiring her as a nursing student when she was in school with my cousin, Mary Helen. And I came up to the dorm one time to spend the night with Mary Helen. That's the first time I met Elaine. The next time I was on SST, and Danny and Elaine were traveling in Asia, and they stopped by my SST site. It was really exciting. Um, in South Korea. But the way I got to know her the most is as a school nurse at Westview, and several other of our team are here today. Um, Elaine and I shared growing up on a turkey farm. We used to compare the scratches on our arms from catching turkeys, talked about the sick pen that the turkeys were in. Um, but our favorite thing was um, carpooling to and from work. And during the difficult time, um, we used to sing together. And we sang this song, <clears throat> You are all we have, you give us what we need. Our lives are in your hands, O oh Lord. Our lives are in, our hand, in your hands. Our other share, the, besides being Westview school nurses, I think black licorice was our most <laughs> common um, commonality. We always had a stash in each of our cubby holes. <laughs> that we didn't want our husbands to find, so we had to eat it all. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Hope this microphone is, yeah, it works. Like four inch heels are working. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, for sharing your stories of my mother. She's a wonderful woman, and I say that in present tense because she's still with me. Um, we've been through a lot as a family. My mother taught me lots of things, some things my dad doesn't know about yet, which I'll fill him in on later. Some of my wildness comes from Elaine, not from me, just so you know. Um, but through some of your stories, I've gotten to know my mother in a way that I, I didn't know her. So, we will miss her. I'm very thankful to this church, to Talasha and Daniel, and to everyone who loved her and knew her in their own way as well. And we are going to miss her, and I think of her every day, um, and I keep her ashes with me. So, thank you all for celebrating her life with us. I don't know if second chances are allowed, but um, Barb, seeing you up here made me remember something I wanted to say, that she wrote me a letter about the experience of choosing you that Dan referred to. Um, somehow in my mind, did you actually look in the window and see all the babies that were in the orphanage, nursery or not? Okay, because I had this image, the way she described the magnitude of that decision 
to choose to give one baby a new life and you were kind of ruling out the option of all others, not consciously. But I just think I want to second what your dad said about how confident that your mom and dad were when they chose you. And um, it was just a beautiful letter. And maybe it played into she and my decision-making issue that she wrote it, but um, I could almost feel the twisting within herself. And like Dan said, she just wept because she knew this was such a monumental decision. But the important thing was the peace that came after it was made in having chosen you. So just a second what your dad said. <clears throat> My name is Carmen Marino. I was not prepared to come up here and talk today, so you'll have to excuse me. I got to know Elaine through Dan's stories over the last few years. And never in my life did I imagine to be touched by someone I barely even knew personally. But through Dan's stories, my life has been changed in the most beautiful and healing of ways. For many years I've been suffering with chronic illness, chronic pain. And oftentimes Dan will ask me, how do you cope? How do you keep smiling through all the pain? And I've never really been able to find the words to tell Dan, in large part, because of Aline. Over the last few years, he's shared stories of bravery and faith, kindness, adventure, and humor beyond anything I'd ever read in stories growing up. There weren't fairy tales, the love they had, it was real. The spirit she had, has, is so real that I'm standing up here today <laughs> with my heart so full, knowing that fairy tales do exist in people, that heroes do exist, love exists. It's because of Elaine, in large part, that I decided to take a bit of a leap and I'm going to be going to Tanzania to teach next year for four months. After Dan told me the stories of choosing Barb over the Olympics and not having a single regret, and of these spontaneous things that she would do, of the wildly painted van <laughs> that they chose, as you saw in the images. And I'd like to, um, I'd like to close by um, telling you about the moment I learned of Elaine's passing. I was in Mexico, it was at night, and I read the email from the church. Instantly, I had this huge hole in my chest but at the same time, it was so calm because I knew that someone that had lived such a beautiful life was finally in God's arms in the warmth of his embrace. I looked at the stars in the sky. I went outside onto the roof of the place I was in Mexico and they were vibrant and I texted Dan in that very moment and shared with him an Eskimo proverb I remember reading. Perhaps they are not stars, but rather openings in heaven, where the love of our lost ones pours through and shines down upon us to let us know that they are happy. 
Thank you. Well, if there are no other stories to share now, that is fine. This has been another holy moment spent together. So I simply want to close with a benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace all your days. Amen.